So the ACL, uh, as, as many of us know, is it's very popular these days from a sports injury standpoint, uh, is one of the main central stabilizing ligaments of the knee. So uh, when the ACL, we can use this knee model, is right in, in the front and it is in the inside of the knee and, and cruciate means cross in Latin. So you've got two ligaments in the knee and one's the ACL, which is the one we're going to be speaking of, which is here uh, going from the tibia or the leg bone to the thigh bone on the outside. And the other one is the PCL, which is in the back. So those two ligaments cross in the knee and that's why they're called the cruciate ligaments. The ACL very commonly is a non-contact injury, so you don't necessarily have to, you know, have a 300-pound uh, lineman hit you to tear your ACL. 70% uh, of injuries are non-contact, so it's a twist, and the knee gets put in a val we call it a valgus type position, and it can tear your ACL doing that. Soccer is a very common one, so we see many, many soccer players that unfortunately have ACL ruptures. You know, any, uh, you know, any sport that uh, does cutting, twisting, so for example, you don't see an ACL injury in swimmers uh, for, uh, because there's no cutting or, or twisting in that, in that sport, of course. So we see it a lot uh, in, you know, in, our fall, in, in the fall sports, so we'll see you know, many ACL injuries uh, with football, uh, and then and soccer is very common as well. Well, we do know that, for example, we talked about soccer, uh, women in soccer are about seven times more likely to uh, tear their ACL uh, than, than men. Uh, we do know that from a, a female standpoint, there are some risk factors, just the alignment. The female alignment, uh, unfortunately, predisposes them to ACL injuries. We think that, we, we all know as well that uh, during uh, uh, the uh, uh, hormonal cycles, uh, there are certain times when uh, females are more prone to injury to the ligament. Um, and we talked about from a sports standpoint, you know, they're just being, if you want to call them higher, more high risk activities for ACL injuries, uh, that definitely predisposes the athlete, um, be it, uh, you know, high school, collegiate, uh, professional or recreational. So we see many, many ACL injuries and you're in, in, they come from an ACL sprain where the ligament is completely intact, however, just uh, uh, stretched a little bit all the way to full thickness ruptures where the ligament is gone. So there's definitely the rehab potential for certain ACL injuries. Uh, for example, we'll see people, even if you have a, a partial where say maybe 50 to 60% of the ACL is torn, we can absolutely start with the rehab uh, a protocol to see if we can re recover the athlete or, and, uh, and the possibility that they might not need surgery. The full thickness uh, rupture, specifically in our you know, high school and collegiate athletes are, are typically always surgical, um, but really it, it truly depends on, on, on the uh, lifestyle as well. And really for me, when somebody comes in with an ACL, it's about their lifestyle and what they like to do. So for the most part, uh, the high school collegiate um, uh, uh, athlete, uh, they're pretty much always going to have their ACL reconstructed because what we know is if you don't reconstruct your ACL, the, the knee stays loose. And, that, and the problem with the knee being loose is number one, it's hard to perform. So you, when you're trying to run or cut or turn, uh, the knee gives way. So the, the athlete uh, will fall down. Um, so that becomes a problem. Furthermore, you can continue damaging the rest of your knee. So if you don't have an ACL that's competent, you can further damage the meniscus, you can further damage the cart other cartilage structures in the knee, and, it, it, and basically you begin to get an early degenerative knee uh, at a young age. So who becomes a candidate for it? Uh, number one, it depends on your lifestyle. So obviously the, the athletes are pretty much always going to have their ACLs reconstructed. Or you modify your lifestyle. So if you say, well, I'm not going to play softball anymore, I'm not going to um, uh, do the sports that I enjoy because I don't want surgery, I'm going to do more sedentary activity, that's fine and that's a personal decision. But that's something that uh, uh, what, what we wouldn't do is recommend you know, going back to playing soccer uh, without uh, a competent ACL. So importantly, when somebody needs an ACL reconstruction, it's, it's uh, uh, one of the very common questions. And, and oftentimes patients will do research and it's sort of like, what graft choice do you use? And in my hands, we, we have three and I, I do a lot of all of these graphs. So uh, there's your uh, big picture, it's your own tissue versus cadaver tissue. And typically uh, under 40, 
I'll use your own tissue. And again, this can all be changed. I mean, I've done triathletes that are in their 50s and we use their own tissue. So nothing is, is black or white and it's always can be discussed, of course. Uh, but in my hands, uh, the patellar tendon is a great graft choice uh, for the high school athlete. Uh, I like it for the aggressive you know, motocross, MMA person. What that graft is, it's, it's the patient's own tissue and you take a little piece of the patella, the kneecap, the central third of the patellar tendon and then a little plug from the the tibia bone. Uh, the advantage to the patellar tendon graft is that it is bone to bone healing. In orthopedics we really like bone to bone healing. Uh, uh, it's predictable. Um, it's very, the, the patellar tendon graft is very tried and true. It's still considered the gold standard in the majority of uh, higher level athletes when they do have an ACL disruption uh, obtain the patellar tendon autograft. The second graft choice is a hamstring. So that's also your own tissue. And basically what we do, it's again a small incision. The hamstring tendons hook onto the leg bone right in this region. So we're able to actually harvest them from an incision at the knee. Uh, in my hands, as people uh, turn into their 20s and go into their 30s, the hamstring uh, graft is, is one that I, I really um, have had a lot of success with. And um, if the, the difference is from a, a healing standpoint is you have the soft tissue to bone uh, healing versus the patellar tendon is bone to bone. Uh, we do know that it, is, it takes a little bit longer for soft tissue to heal to bone. However, we, think, we know that the fixation or how we fix the tendon to the bone these days is much better than what it was 10 years ago. Uh, so we're, pretty, we're very confident in that graft choice. Um, the difference between those two, the patellar tendon is more challenging to recover from. So oftentimes the high school or collegiate athlete may have a bit more time in their hands to recover uh, versus somebody say maybe in their 30s that is currently you know, you know, working, has other obligations. Uh, the hamstring can, is a little bit easier to recover from, not dramatically, but, but, uh, but a little bit easier. So that also comes into play as far as you know, what uh, a graft uh, to choose. The third graft or final graft that we'll talk about is the cadaver. Um, it, the cadaver tendon was very popular for the younger ages um, uh, ten, 10 years ago or so, and, and we saw that. However, there's been some recent data showing that we've had a very a smaller risk of recurrence or re-rupture uh, in that patient population. So in my hands, I, I do not typically put a cadaver in a high school athlete or, or a collegiate athlete, for example. Uh, a cadaver does really, really well. You know, as we mature, say over 40, 45, uh, we start talking about you know the cadaver tissue uh, being uh, a, a graft of choice in that it, it is probably it is it is the easiest to recover from um, and uh, it's it's a, a great graft it uh, allows the weekend warrior to get back to doing things and in in really um, uh, in that age group it's a it's a wonderful graft choice you know we're, we're aggressive with physical therapy and we can be aggressive appropriately because we're our fixation or how we, we keep the graft intact in the body is, is very good, it's very rigid, and it works quite well. So, you know, the aggressive protocols are we'll get patients started in physical therapy within a couple of days. Uh, they're able to move their knee, uh, full range of motion. They're able to put full weight on it. So usually patients will be on crutches for uh, assuming there's no other work done in the knee, just an ACL injury. Uh, you're able to put full weight on it right away and people are on crutches, you know, typically between, uh, for two weeks. And oftentimes they're off of, off of the crutches between week two and three. The initial recovery is fairly quick. However, the whole ACL uh, maturation process takes a very long time, meaning um, before we allow patients to go back to you know, cutting, turning, twisting sports, you're looking at six months, minimum. ACL surgery is a very successful surgery. It, it allows uh, patients uh, and athletes to get back to their uh, chosen sports uh, uh, predictably. The, one of the big risks I think is don't underestimate the recovery uh, in that it is long and it is something that needs there needs to be good dedication there because if you're if you if, if the patient's not willing to do physical therapy or they're not motivated to do that then they could have a knee that's actually worse off so that's going to be very important to you know be dedicated and committed, and uh, most of the time people are in that they're you know they're athletes and they want to get back to their chosen you know sport, and that's a great carrot and, and we sort of emphasize the importance of that, uh, kind of to have that goal to you know want to get back to you know a sport or you know a, a chosen 
area and um, I think that definitely helps motivate and keeps people engaged in the therapy process.